O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Deliver me, O oh Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rest Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love, in, uh, love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. How beautiful that Roman 8 text is. And it's one that I often quote in sermons. It's also one that I often misquote in sermons. I don't get them all right and they get all jumbled in my head and what comes out is all of them, just not necessarily in the right order. But it's all true. I can usually get death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers. But then I get a little fuzzy when it comes to things to come nor powers. Regardless, this text reminds us of the Garden of Eden. And I will explain that to you further because that doesn't seem like it would make sense. Why would Romans chapter 8, what I read, bring to mind the Garden of Eden. Well, you could say, you could take the the cheap route and say, well, pastor, you know, original sin came from that. Therefore, all of Scripture uh, is the law and is the gospel, the bomb for it. And you would be right, but that's not what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say is something that I think that this text is crying out to say and does say it but does not necessarily, theologians do not necessarily go back and make this connection. And perhaps I'm wrong to do so, but I don't think so. When the serpent was in the the, the Garden of Eden, he had one modus operandi, one motive of operation. And he, he had one thing that he had to do and everything that, subs- that, that, that followed with it were the effects of sin. But the one thing that he wanted to do and the one thing that he desired to do and the one thing that he was successful in doing was separating man and God. If you can separate man from God or God from man, then you have two different Modus operandi, motive of operations. Like I said in the sermon this morning, in the beginning, God's will was God's will, and God's will was our will. And then all of a sudden, the serpent came into the garden, and God's will remained God's will, but our will became our will. We became our own little gods running here and running there thinking that we had some kind of power or, or authority over anything. And just so, so that they got the hint that 
when they left the garden, they couldn't say, look at me growing such beautiful things. What did Yahweh say? In childbirth, you will have pains. And from by the sweat of your brow, you will sow crops. A reminder. A reminder of what you did in the Garden of Eden. And so when that tree grew in the Garden of Eden, the serpent was, uh, was twisted around it. There's this beautiful painting. Uh, it's, the name of it just slipped my mind. Um, but it's a beautiful watercolor painting of the devil twisted up a tree and he has the fruit in his mouth and Eve has the other end of the fruit in her mouth and, and uh, Adam is over here like this, turning his back, not, not paying attention to what's going on. That's why I think that the first sin was not so much the eating, but of Adam's neglect of his wife. And yet the eating certainly put the seal on it. But the reason I bring that up, Satan is seductive and he seduced Eve. That's why I love Robert Blake. That it was Robert Blake. Uh, when really the kiss of death. And at that point, that tree stood against man and God. And we were separate. And by separate, one the, the fruit, it was murder. It escalated rather quickly. And then from, from then on, uh, humans got used to pains and ch pain and childbirth. And running here and running there and we were happy being separate aren't we happy being separate from God isn't it much easier I mean it's easier to run and have your own and, and indulge in your own passions it's much easier and maybe this is something that not many pastors will say but sinning's fun Sinning is alluring. Sinning is a good time. And if it wasn't for that pesky law of God to bring us around, we could have a better time. But in that better time, in that sinning is fun, in that being our own little gods, we find hell itself burning within our bosom because we are separated from God. From the Garden of Eden until a certain date. And that date was Christ in utero. When God took on flesh and opened the womb of, of woman, the blessed Mary, and stepped forth the, the King of all to reign from a cross of wood. And in that cross, we find the atonement of man. And then, of course, the resurrection, giving hope to all who were lost, all who were separated. And in the resurrection, we find, or in the ascension, we find that, cr that Christ goes into heaven so that He might send the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, we are no longer at war with God. We are no longer separated. And that's what Paul tells the Romans. We were once separated from God. We were once separated from Yahweh. We were as far as the east is from the west. And then Christ came to earth and He became our Messiah. He, he not only bridged the gap, but He brought humanity into heaven and he heaven to humanity. We were once separated by the devil. But I, I am sure, 
that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor power nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that we find in Christ Jesus. Outside of that, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Sin may be alluring, but nothing is as captivating as the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that captivity, we gladly hide in the wounds of Jesus, saying, come on, Satan. Come on, demons. Come have your way. For I have a Savior who not only stands between me and you, but one who makes sure that I am never separated from my God. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever.